Community Matters, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And uh, today uh, we have the honor again of Rabbi Itchel Krasinjanski. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure to be here. You're the rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii, and um, that name appeared in the newspaper a few days ago because it was a Chabad uh, synagogue in... Um, Poway, California. Poway, 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 uh, south of San, San Diego, Diego, where that shooting happened. Uh, and so that has a special meaning for you. I must say also that Rabbi uh, Goldstein. Was Yisrael uh, Goldstein. Goldstein looks a lot like you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, the white beard and the, the yeah. yarmulke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this is uh, of interest to all Jews, all people for that matter, but it's a special interest to <coughs> Chabad, isn't it? Well, um, well, I don't know if interest is the right word, but it definitely... Uh, it, um, Struck very close to home. Actually, struck home uh, with Rabbi Goldstein. You knew him, yeah, very well. We were uh, we grew up together. Uh, we're just a year apart. I'm a year older than him. Very, very fine fellow. Very nice fellow. And his true colors uh, came out in this um, horrific couple of minutes when uh, when the shooter the terrorist came in and began to shoot as he himself retold it, um, to the press that um, the guy was standing literally right in front of him um, and he stood there with his rifle, uh, aimed it at the rabbi, and the rabbi um, tried to protect his, his, his face reaction. from on what was coming, and two major miracles happened. Uh, one is that the guy couldn't shoot, so even though he was in very close range, didn't hit his face or his body, he hit his hands, two of his fingers actually, two of his index fingers. One of them was blown off, and the other one was very badly injured. I believe uh, he went through surgery and Hoping, hope, hoping that they'll be able to save the finger. But, um, and then the biggest miracle happened is that the gun jammed and he couldn't continue shooting. It was an assault rifle. It was an assault rifle. And there were two members of the congregation. One was um, a Border Patrol uh, police. He was Jewish, so he came to the service. And then there was someone else also with a military background. And they, and they right away uh, jumped in, and they, um, one of them picked up a chair and threw it at this fellow, this terrorist, as hard as he could. And the guy uh, turned around and ran. But in the meantime, the rabbi, who was bleeding profusely, uh, his first thought was uh, the children. So he immediately ran to the other room, and he um, accounted for all the children, and he, and he escorted them out of the building. Um, and then he went back to check on the congregants. And that's when he saw this woman, her name was Lori Kay, who, from what I understand, uh, she was in the lobby with the rabbi when the gunman was shooting, and she right away jumped in to protect the rabbi. She took a bullet for him, and she passed away. Her husband, who was she also... Saved him. He saved his life. At her, the expense of her own. Her own life. Her husband, who uh, is a doctor, uh, you know, in all the commotion, when he saw this person uh, lying on the floor bleeding, he right away rushed to do whatever he could to resuscitate her. And while he was doing it, he noticed it's his wife. And he fainted. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Right? Yeah, so it was, a, it was a very horrific scene. And the most, you know, the most moving thing, or very moving thing, was that after. The gentleman ran out, and uh, gentleman's hardly the word. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
the terrorists ran out. The rabbi, uh, the paramedics had come, and they wanted to put, take the rabbi in, in, in an ambulance, but before he went into the ambulance, he felt it important to um, say a few words to the people there, to the congregation. And he spoke very, very movingly, and he said that um, he tried to encourage them, he tried to give them comfort, and he basically said that, uh, you know, we're in the holiday of Passover, when we say in the this was on the last day, the of, last day of Passover, this is a day when um, more than usually people come to synagogue to say Yisker, the Yisker prayer the for, prayer for the dead, prayer for the loved ones, right? And he basically said that in the Haggadah we read that how in every generation they rise up to to kill us, and God uh, saves us from them, and uh, this is what they just lived through, and He gave them strength, and He said that. Um, We've survived all the pogroms and the killings. This and is what the rabbi is saying. The rabbi is saying, while he took a talus, a prayer shawl, and he wrapped his hand in a prayer shawl because oh, it was bleeding. It was symbolic. Right. And he, get, and he spoke very, 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 uh, you know, very uh, uplifting words. And then he was taken to the hospital. And he'll, he'll, he'll be thinking about this every day for the loss of his finger anyway. Loss of his finger and everyone the, who knows the loss it. of the woman, yeah. The woman and the loss of the woman saved his life. And other, other people wounded. There were two other people, interestingly or sadly, uh, they were uh, both from Israel, a young girl and her uncle. Visiting. The young girl, I think, was living. No, they moved there and they were at the synagogue. Why did they move there? Because they were living in the uh, south, in a city called Sderot close to the border with Gaza, and they have continuous rockets, missiles, yeah, missiles rockets, coming in yeah. from Hamas, and they moved to San Diego to get away from it. To get away from the violence. Get away from, from the, the violence, Gaza. right. Thank God uh, the girl wasn't injured badly, as well as her uncle also wasn't injured badly. They're, they're not yeah, I saw I saw um, some footage of the rabbi afterward mm. in the hospital. Yeah, he was again very articulate and moving. And uh, I wonder, you know, how what kind of effect does this have on the congregation? What kind of effect does it have on the Jewish community there in Poway? Poway, I think it's pronounced Poway. Poway. Um, well, firstly, shock and horror, and uh, real sadness. For the, for the senseless killing of a person. Uh, but many, many years ago, in the 1950s, there was a terrorist incident in Bar Chabad. Bar Chabad is the village in Israel that was established by Chabad, primarily for the many Jews that were coming in from the former Soviet Union. Yeah. And before it was popular, if we can use that word, there was a very tragic terrorist act where some Palestinians um, got into the town, they, through the orange groves that surrounded the town, and they went into the school. With the children. Where the children were there, or young adults, teenagers, young teenagers, and they started shooting at them. And uh, the teacher was killed, and four young students were killed. And it was, uh, it was shock and sadness and horror. And at the time, the Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson, he gave a talk. And he said that uh, the only way to... to uh, address the, you know, this horrible uh, incident. The only way to try to fill the void and, and the sadness is by uh, redoubling our efforts in doing good. Based on what uh, the line in the Zohar, which is the main work of Jewish mysticism, where the expression is that little light dispels a lot of darkness. Uh, the, the, the terrorists and these terrorists come from a place of total darkness. 
Their hearts are filled with hate. And um, the only way to uh, combat that is to come back with strong, stronger light. So the Rebbe initiated then the campaign to build five new institutions for each of the who were Interesting. victims who, who, were, who, were, who were slaughtered. And um, this has been the Rebbe's uh, approach to uh, addressing you know, things of this nature. It has been said uh, that um, the Rebbe himself came out of the Holocaust. He was a survivor of the Holocaust. And um, his, 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 his voyage to America was with the last ship that sailed out of Paris before they shut it all down, the Nazis oh shut it all Oh, my goodness. Down, right? Talk about being lucky. Wow. So, and the Rebbe came to uh, New York on the American shores. And um, in 1950, when he took over the leadership, he was dealing with a world or a Jewish community that has been decimated and, and the survivors were, were, were broken, his body and spirit. Many of them were, you know, sole survivors of large families. So the, Rebbe, um, the Rebbe's approach was, as it's been described, whereas the Nazis uh, hunted down the Jewish people with hate, purpose of killing them. The Rebbe's uh, effort was to search out all Jews with love and to uh, strengthen them with love and acceptance, and guidance. And that's how uh, Chabad was rebuilt after it was entirely destroyed and shattered. Yeah. And that's been the motto of Chabad, you know, you know, I've, you've you've said that before here, and I'm sure Rabbi Goldstein. Well, he was yeah. articulating the same view. Right. I mean, it's, that is Chabad, right? That's what Chabad is about, right? <clears throat> On the other hand, there are people out there who would like to arm, have an armed guard. There was a discussion on the radio yesterday yeah, about this. Yeah, I, I think it's very uh, prudent, practical. Uh, I actually we got a lot of emails from friends who said. You know, you have to stop playing around. You have to hire armed guards. We even received suggestions, as I know many other synagogues and Chabad uh, houses throughout the country have, is to have someone in the congregation to have a concealed weapon. Well, I don't know the laws in Hawaii. I know in other states it's permitted to have concealed weapon. Yeah, there was the discussion on um, NPR was. Um um, people were not disagreeing with the notion of having an armed guard, um, but they were, not, they were not really enthusiastic about arming the people in the congregation. It's complicated, and it just seems too, too far. How do you feel know. about that? I, I don't, uh, well, I mean, the whole, the whole problem is a very uh, hard-to-believe problem, that anti-Semitism has, you know, has reared its ugly head recently here in the States, you know, just six months ago in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, and just this week in Abad. And actually, uh, it's not just in the United States, all over the world. There's yeah. a resurgence of anti-Semitism. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The Anti-Defamation League reported that there was another substantial increase, I forget what it was, about 15% increase in attacks on Jews in this country in the past year. And my recollection is that uh, that's what they've been saying uh, with larger or smaller amounts, but always substantial amounts of increase in anti-Semitism over the past several years. And then you get, you know, the whole gun issue. And then you get what happened in the University of North Carolina just yesterday. Someone walks in and shoots up a class. Not clear why or exactly who he is yet. But uh, we have a lot of guns on a lot of campuses and a lot of people being slaughtered. What, what troubles me is there's an intersection between that and anti-Semitism. Well, I think it really uh, behooves us, you know, something as shocking and as uh, painful as uh, the shooting in the synagogue. Uh, um, when something like that happens, it 
almost like forces us to sit up and to think things, you know, very, very, think, think, think through things very, very deeply and thoroughly. And specifically, I'm talking about the Rebbe was a huge, huge advocate of uh, having silent prayer in the public school. There was a lot of pushback, and it never, never really happened. What the Rebbe was saying is that the, the goal of education uh, is to shape and form and raise uh, uh, healthy human beings, not just to get a degree and to, and to become a money machine, so make money, but to become a mensch, to be a, a decent a, human a being. Decent human being. And the only way for, for a way for children to be able to absorb that is by having a moment prayer, silent prayer. When children know that there's a supreme being that's real, that uh, is watchful of, of, of everything that happens, you grow up in that kind of uh, uh, environment, then you're, you know, you're, you, know, you, you stay in, you stay in line. Silent prayer is part of the Jewish uh, service. Uh, silent devotion. I forget the right, name. What's right. the name of it? Is yeah, the name Amida. Of it? The, Amida. Amida. Amida prayer. Yeah. But we're talking about not just Jewish. We're talking about the children who are in public schools that are Jewish, non-Jewish, and all, all denominations. But when you, when you. Um, when you um, deny children this daily reminder uh, of there's a God and there's justice and there's, uh, you know, there's, there's rules in how to live and expectations, uh, in absence of that, we have a whole generation that's growing up um, really believing that uh, you can get away with things. Right. And, uh, you know, morals are not, there's no absolute morals, it's just whatever, it's all relative. And we see the consequences. When you were growing up, when I was growing up, it was unheard of to have people come shoot up schools, uh, right. children shooting at children. Right. It was unheard of. And after and, Columbine, it keeps on happening. Right. It's and almost that like one reinforces the next one. And, and in one, you know, one or two generations. It's, 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 so, uh, you know, I would like to explore with you what this is, this increase in anti-Semitism um, now at a time when, you know, you and I have both seen most of our lives. We haven't seen this. Uh, we've, we've, sure. this, this country has been welcoming and tolerant most of our lives. Sure. All of a sudden it's bubbling up from a dark place. And now we have the people, you know, appearing with guns, appearing with the most outrageous statements, denying the Holocaust. Um, you know, and finding, finding words for Jews that are outrageous, um, I, I do not, frankly, do not understand it. Many people have tried to explain it to me. Many people have, have explained, you know, the historical process and the, you know, the continuing existence of this, this anti-Semitic anti viewpoint down there deep in a given culture or country. And yet I still... Honestly, Rabbi, I do not understand it. Can you help me understand it? Well, um, as you said, it's actually inexplicable. Anti-Semitism over the generations has uh, been explained for so many different reasons and contradictory reasons. Uh, in communist countries, the Jews were were um, killed because they were the capitalists. Uh, in capitalist countries, Jews were killed because they were communists. They were uh, <laughs> religious. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> yeah, uh, religious inspired anti-Semitism uh, for the alleged claim that Jew the Jews were responsible in killing Jesus. Uh, happened for thousands of years. But yet, communist Russia, that was uh, an atheist uh, government, they still, they hated Jews also. Nothing to do with Jesus. So there really is no 
explanation. But, you know, there's an expression that says, you know, um, if you really want to get a clear picture about yourself, don't go talking to your friends, go talk to your enemies. <laughs> and you'll get, a, you'll get a very clear picture about yourself. So okay. if you read in my Kampf uh, from Hitler, his name be erased, uh, he writes there the reason why he uh, came up with the final solution is because the Jews brought a disease to mankind that he felt is his responsibility to cleanse humanity from this disease. This disease he referred to as consciousness. Consciousness. Yeah, yeah. That people have a conscience. A con okay. Conscience. Yeah, conscience. And moral, you know, right and wrong. We don't want that. He felt that that was corrupting. <laughs> standing in his way. <laughs> standing in his way. So uh, the Jew represents the world, basically uh, uh, God's message to humanity. And, um, you know, people who have problems with the message take it out on the messenger. Yeah. One, one thought I've had from time to time is this, is that, you know, humankind is a political animal. And uh, in our government, in our structures, in our you know, institutions, we have politics. We will always have politics. And part of politics is power, getting to the top. Maybe politics is, we start with po power, and politics is a, is, a, is, a, is a way to get there. In order to get there, you need a scapegoat. You need a scapegoat. You always have to have a scapegoat. You have to climb on somebody else and put somebody else down in order to rise up. The, a human foible, maybe it's not universal, but it's, it's in many places, in many ways. And the Jews are handy. They're a handy scape. We, we've used them before. They've been used before in history. So if you want to look for a scapegoat, there's a good candidate. You can get some, you know, get some traction that way. Just, just you know, go scapegoat a Jew. It's something like that. Well, you're right. Jews have been the scapegoats for, for uh, so many of the world's ills. And they, blame, they conveniently blamed on the Jews. The Black Plague, interestingly enough, um, where so many millions of people were killed, did not affect the Jewish community uh, as it did affect the because general of their hygiene. Because of their hygiene, because part of ritual in Judaism is to wash your hands all the time. But they or as proof positive that the Jews were behind it. And that's why they were not uh, affected by it. That caused this program. So yeah, the Jews have been made the scapegoats. And, but the question is, what, what needs to be our reaction? We cannot control, we cannot control the hatred coming from others. What needs to be our reaction? So the first thing, as we just mentioned before, the Rebbe said, we have to push back with uh, indiscriminate acts of goodness and kindness and love and, and all those positive stuff that eventually will, 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 will have an impact. And, and that's right. pushing back to everybody, not just yeah. Oh, yeah, right. fellow so, Jews, but to everyone. Exactly. Maimonides writes uh, that a person has to view the world as, you know, like a scale, and it's like even... Even the good and the bad are, are, are even. And a person has to think that, that his one good, his or her one good deed, one good act, could tilt the scales for the entire universe. You don't know for sure, but um, it's possible. Possible. So therefore, you know, often we tend to think the problem is so big. You know, what will my little act of kindness uh, it's like climate change. What would my little act do? Right. Well, something. You'll, you'll do something. Exactly. <laughs> and not just something. So what do you do with this fellow, um, I want to say his name was Ernest, the one in the terrorist. The terrorist, you mean? The terrorist. He's an American terrorist. Yeah. Um, the terrorists don't have to be from the Middle East. They can be American terrorists. I and mean, you judge them by their acts. You know? Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I consider him a, a, a nutcase uh, and in many ways a schmuck. 
because he never really learned what, what the world is around him. He never learned that. And he does this for but a living. Could you know? that be an indictment on society, on how we are raising our young? It could be. We need to, we need to rethink you know, the kind of um, uh, environment the young generation is growing up in. You grow up in an environment, in a godless society where anything goes, and then step number two is you got to look out for yourself and yourself only, and anyone that's perceived to get into your way is enemy. So, yeah, things like this will happen. If, if a young children are raised in an environment where uh, it's, it's, it's an emphasis on you know, living good and doing good and sharing and caring, and, uh, then uh, you know, these things get reinforced in, you know, through the schools and the homes, and that will, you know, that will uh, have uh, an effect on, on, the, on the children. The harder the question is what, and that's futuristic. And, and, and I certainly totally agree with that. We have to build a better, a better educational system, a better way of teaching people so that we have a, a more responsible, more decent citizenship. But here, Ernest, his last name, I don't know his first name. May his name be erased. Yeah. Um, Ernest has done this, and when he went to court in the arraignment, I think it was yesterday, he pleaded not guilty. Fifty-seven people saw him. He, made a, he acknowledged his responsibility at the scene, um, but he pleaded not guilty. What? What's his loss? What's going on here? <clears throat> and he's, he isn't contrite in the smallest way. Can you fix him? What do we do with Ernest? Well, first of all, he probably has been advised by uh, lawyers that his parents got for him, even though they, they I saw, gave out a statement. It was a very... I thought it was a good statement. They apologized and they said that, that their son sucked into you know, this, this dark world and uh, he's now uh, one in a line of any who have, uh, who have uh, turned against the Jews in, in violent attacks. Well, first of all, I do hope that... Um, I do hope that... Um, you know, society and the justice system will um, will uh, do justice, and you know we don't have death penalty. We don't we want the law. system to send a message that this is okay. We rather want the system to send a message that this is not okay. You pay a price for this. Exactly. I'm but, so sad about this. You know, I'm so sad not only because of the the horror of that event, but that it is in a chain of events. And in Pittsburgh is only a year ago, and not even a year ago, not even a year ago. It's just months ago. Right, six, six months, months ago. Six yeah, months ago. and now this um, is awful. And I, we all have to make peace with ourselves living in a world like this. A, but we also need to do play our role in pushing back with, you know, with positive act. You know, senseless hatred can only be defeated by senseless love. Just just feel love for other people, you know, help out, care, and eventually it becomes a chorus of acts of goodness but and kindness. that kind teaches of. people, that carries the message. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. It's a Rabbi pleasure as Angel always. Rabbi Jansky, we love having you. Um, I'd like to say that uh, in response to... Um, it's horrible. Oh, you're going to have a, 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 serum, a, a, yeah. a service. Yeah, this Shabbos, this Saturday, at our Chabad house, like in the rabbi, Rabbi Goldstein, uh, when he was interviewed, asked that the response should be that Jews of all stripes would fill the synagogues uh, this weekend, this Shabbos, uh, to show, morning. yeah, Saturday morning, to show, uh, you know, solidarity and, pr and pride in being Jewish. And uh, not to allow this to keep us down and saddened and depressed. Yeah. We're here in Hawaii. Yeah. We're going to have the Saturday morning yeah. at Chabad House. Everyone is encouraged to come and has to come. And we will, um, we will do our share in responding to this uh, yes. horrific thing. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, as always.